We often talk about strange disappearances on this channel, and once before I've specifically looked at highly intelligent people who'd gone missing under unusual circumstances. I thought I'd have a look again to see what I could find. All of these disappearances had elements to them that are odd, perhaps suspicious in some circumstances, and very questionable as you'll come to see. You be the judge. Now, let's go back in time to 1975, Yosemite National Park. Dr. Edgar Gordon was 68 years old when he disappeared from Yosemite National Park. Dr. Gordon was a very intelligent man. He was a highly regarded physician who worked in Madison, Wisconsin, and he had done so for many years. Later in life, he became the chief of staff at various university hospitals, and he practiced what he preached to. He was a huge fitness buff, and he kept in shape. He was an avid hiker and an experienced cross-country skier. This is precisely what he was doing with one of his sons that day in Yosemite. They were there to hike and ski, to have a great time together in the park. Little did they know that this would be the last time that they would ever see each other again. The first time I came across this disappearance was from the Oakland Tribune who reported this on the 6th of April 1975. A search was underway for Edgar, missing in a near blizzard in the National Park. He was reported missing about noon Friday after a storm moved into the area and dropped 17 inches of snow. The timing here was absolutely atrocious and everything that could have possibly gone wrong all happened at the same time. One article stated that Dr. Gordon and his son decided to split up near Badger Pass and see who could make it back to the car park first. Another article stated that Edgar had simply become tired at this point and made his way back to the car alone. It's not clear which is true, but whatever the case may be, as the article stated almost immediately after this decision was made, they'd both travelled some distance away from one another and the weather, described as a freak spring storm, descended on the area, engulfing both of them. If they'd have waited just a couple more minutes before making the decision to split up, this incident would never have taken place. A 50-man search crew so far has failed to locate a 68-year-old physician missing on a skiing trip here, but a ranger said he is hopeful the doctor will be found sheltering in a snow cave. They had every reason to believe this might very well be the case too, because it obviously wasn't Dr. Gordon's first time doing this. He'd taken refuge in a snow cave prior to this incident while on a skiing trip. As described by his family, he had experience with this, which led to all involved to hold out hope for him, knowing that he would have some semblance of an idea as to what he should do. Blizzard conditions and waist deep snow hampered search operations Sunday for Dr. Gordon, who hasn't been seen since. The freak spring storm has dumped more than three feet of snow on the area since Friday. Becoming increasingly frustrated with the lack of results of the search effort, both of the sons of Dr. Gordon each took charge of a search dog team and they led searches through the snowy hills of Yosemite National Park. Snow fell on the searchers Monday and more light snow was expected today. More than 40 inches have fallen since the doctor was last seen, most of it in a freak two-day storm over the weekend. Gordon's son, whom he split from, Robert, is leading one of the three dog teams and was joined by his brother, Dr. Stuart Gordon and both continued the search today. The military were also wanting to get involved here and bring in their helicopters, but once more, the weather would have other plans. A park ranger said late Monday, the cloud ceiling had lowered in an area of the search, forcing an accompanying military helicopter to call off its efforts. Temperatures in the Badger Pass area were around freezing in the afternoon, a respite from one point during the weekend when they dropped to five below zero. Searchers held on in hopes that Gordon had been able to dig himself into a snow trench during the storm. If buried, a ranger explained, his body heat could have helped him survive. We had one guy who stayed in a snow cave for a week with only a pocket full of raisins for food and he came out of it fine. The search went on for a few more days and searchers expressed their surprise that nothing had been found yet. 
it seems that many present were expecting the dog teams to be of more use than they had been, because throughout the search, they hadn't located any kind of scent once. Hope was dim this morning as the search resumed. Temperatures in the area where Gordon was last seen plunged to 8 degrees or minus 13 degrees Celsius overnight. Park rangers scaled down the search today to a few men working with search dogs specially trained to detect human scent through the snow. It seems to me that it becomes so cold so harshly and quickly in the area that all hope seemed to be lost and as a result they began to scale back the search. Presumably, they were also probably worried about having a lot of searches out in the field in such serious conditions. Specifically, Edgar and Robert separated while skiing towards Dewey Point, which is above Bridalvale Falls at the south rim of Yosemite Valley. The area is at an elevation of 8,000 feet, and these areas were searched extensively throughout. This was a fairly obvious decision to make in terms of where the search should be focused because given how quickly and how badly the weather worsened, they came to the conclusion that it would have been almost impossible for Dr. Gordon to have left the area. Some three feet of snow has fallen since Friday, adding to ten feet that was already on the ground. Temperatures have been well below freezing every night. At the time he disappeared, Gordon was wearing only ski pants, a wool shirt, and a nylon windbreaker. He was carrying no food. Rangers said that the chances of survival here were very slim. They also said that a snowstorm that evening brought winds of up to 40 miles an hour and limited visibility to 10 feet. They continued to search for a number of days after this and with an increased dog presence, but still, they didn't find a trace of him. No scent was ever discovered. Dr. Gordon's body would be discovered close to 40 days after the search ended in an area that had been searched many times in the initial effort. A helicopter crew spotted him atop Bridalvale Falls, which had been the focus of the search throughout. Law enforcement said that he must have been under snow at the time during the search, which is why the dogs must not have been able to locate him. This is interesting in and of itself, mind you, because the search helicopter wasn't actually even looking for Dr. Gordon at the time. The helicopter was looking for a party of missing hikers that were thought to have disappeared in approximately the same area. I won't go into their disappearance now, but I may come back to it another time. In the end, Dr. Gordon disappeared without a trace when a sudden freak storm hit the area. No sign of him was found, and the dogs weren't able to find his scent in the area when they initially searched it. Occam's razor would suggest that at some point he must have succumbed and been buried by the snow. Searchers did show surprise initially when searching these areas with their German Shepherds because they stated that their dogs could find a scent beneath the snow, but it seems that they weren't able to hear for one reason or another. Now, given that's the end of the paper trail, let's move on to the next disappearance. This one's a little different than usual, as it didn't occur in a wilderness area. In 2001, Don Wiley, 57 years old, a renowned Harvard biology professor, in great shape and at the height of his career, would come to disappear near the Mississippi River. Don was a highly intelligent individual and had expertise in areas outside of, though linked to biology. Before his disappearance, he had taken a great interest in virology and this was a real focus area of his. On the day of his disappearance, he had travelled to Memphis, where he was attending the annual meeting of the Scientific Advisory Board of St. Jude Children's Hospital, along with other intellectuals. After this conference concluded, he and some of his peers headed to a bar inside the Peabody Hotel, where they listened to a piano player while talking about their research endeavours. Don was in high spirits this night, as he was excited to go see his father, who lived around 20 miles north of Memphis. So he switched to a non-alcoholic beverage fairly early on, so his drive wouldn't be disrupted. There's a little bit of weirdness right off the bat, because while it was confirmed that he was at the hotel, no one actually recalled seeing him leave. The only piece of information surrounding that was the bartender suggesting that he left at around 12.30am, but he wasn't completely certain. Later, detectives said that there was around 4 hours of missing time after this that couldn't be accounted for. At 3.47am, 
a trucker on the way to Arkansas called the authorities and reported an abandoned car on the Hernando de Soto Bridge. This car, as you can probably guess, belonged to Don. After the first call, law enforcement received four more within 15 minutes from the first. Meaning that detectives were able to conclude that Don's car hadn't been there for a very long time before the first report. The point being that this was a very high traffic area for truckers, even in the early hours. Investigators came to the realization that whatever happened to Don happened quickly. There was nothing inside or around the car to indicate what might have happened here. There was no sign of a disturbance or anything of that nature. In the short aftermath, it was initially reasoned that this might have been purposeful, though this was disputed. Also of interest was that the authorities seemed to change their stance from this position, but they never gave any specifics as to what they were thinking. Only that it went from being treated as a missing persons investigation to being handed over to teams who look for other possibilities. I can only assume that they were thinking that foul play could have occurred here because the FBI also took an interest in Don's disappearance. What was particularly unusual is that there were absolutely no witnesses at all. No one saw his car stop near the bridge. Authorities questioned many who were in the area that night, but no one had seen Don or his car. Detectives weren't even sure why he was near the bridge in the first place, since he was going in the total opposite direction to his father's house. It's not completely clear what stance the authorities were taking, because even though the case had been handed over to teams who were looking for alternatives to simply being missing, they then stated that foul play had essentially been ruled out because there was no evidence in favour of it. And they noted that going to the bridge would have been a terrible idea in this regard for the perpetrator because of how heavily its roads had travelled. Don's body would be found floating in the river approximately one month after he disappeared. Upon the discovery, it was noted that his shoes were missing, as was his suit jacket, but he was otherwise wearing all of his clothing. The coroner stated that the injuries sustained to Don's body were consistent with the fall to the water, but there was nothing to indicate what might have caused this. Various hypotheses were put forth. The idea that this was purposeful, which his family nor law enforcement seemed to be in favour of in the end, at least as far as I can tell. Another was that he managed to get lost, went to vomit or something to that effect over the rail and then toppled over the rails. I can understand why people may think this may have been a purposeful act, but the problem is that there was nothing to ever indicate that this was the case. There wasn't a note left behind, there were no messages or emails he'd sent to someone indicating this. The people he was with that day spoke of him being in high spirits and he was very excited to be seeing his father. His family were also coming to join him, which he was said to be happy about. It seems that the factors involved were not completely congruent with this version of events. With that being said, the accident hypothesis has its own problems too. He had travelled to an area in the opposite direction he should have been going. Why? It also seems odd that you might literally fall completely over the rails after being sick. I'm sure something like that could happen, but the logistics of that seem a bit off somehow. Or it seems unlikely to happen, I suppose is what I'm saying. It seems that one of his friends agrees, actually. A friend of Wiley's suggests that he went to the railing to vomit. What happened next, I can't imagine, the friend says. But he also says, It's hard for me to imagine a wind gust from an 18-wheeler caused this. He actually very briefly described the problem I was having with that idea. It's hard to imagine how you go from being sick to going over them completely and falling right over the edge. Apparently, Investigators had spent hours dangling over the edge of the rails, trying to figure out how it exactly went down. Here's their conclusion. The curb was 8 inches from the railing, which is only 43 inches high. If he stood against the rail, it's hitting him in the back of the thigh. If he's startled or caught by a gust from an 18-wheeler, his centre of gravity is 47 inches near the top rail below his hip. So to put that plainly, because there was no evidence of this being a purposeful act. What they were saying was that after vomiting, he turned around to face the car. He was leaning back against the railing and a gust of wind from a truck pushed him over. It's important to note though, he did also say 
that the time Don spent during his missing four hours is the missing piece of the puzzle, and without it, you can never have a clear picture. It's also important to note that there was no sign of a struggle on Don's body, only the fall. To clarify also, Don's shoes nor his coat were ever found. So what do you make of this? That's all of the information I was able to find on Don, so let's now have a look at the next disappearance. There is unfortunately, and frustratingly even, a very limited amount of information present on this next case that I'm about to share with you. Though the information that we do have is quite curious, and perhaps somewhat bizarre. Back in 1922, Dr. Irvin Browning, 31 years old at the time, was a physician that worked in Milwaukee next to Chicago. As said, there's very few articles about Dr. Browning, and everything is incredibly vague. From what I can gather, Irving was a man that enjoyed hiking in the countryside in his spare time, and one of the articles insinuates that this might have been what he was doing when he disappeared, though there's no further information there. The other article hits us with something completely different. Here's the headline. Physician missing 12 days returns. Dr. Irvin Browning, physician, missing 12 days and believed to have been taken by striking railway employees was returned to his home Saturday afternoon in a taxi cab. He was in a dazed condition and unable to tell where he'd been or what happened to him. The taxi cab driver disappeared after ringing the doorbell at the Browning residence. I have no idea how we get from a potential hike in the countryside to that, but here we are. No detail was given as to why they thought the striking employees may have taken him, which sounds a little drastic. I assume the suspicion was because they were disgruntled for whatever reason. Unfortunately, that's all I could find on Dr. Browning, but whether he was hiking at the time, or whatever he was doing anywhere, he disappeared for 12 days and wasn't able to recall a single detail about the time he spent missing upon his return. I'm surprised more questions weren't asked about this. How do you disappear for 12 days and have no recollection of what happened or where you'd been? It's also not clear where he was found, but presumably it can't have been too rural or too far from Milwaukee, because he was able to find a place in which he could order or flag a taxi. Anyway, that's basically the end of that, but I thought given what we're talking about, it fits here as a little extra mention. Now, there were a couple of disappearances on highly intelligent people that I've covered in the past, that I felt fit in here, and that's certainly worth sharing again especially since it's been years now since they featured on the channel. From a very young age, Peng Jiamu was said to have a brilliant, curious mind. It seems that Peng was an individual who had an innate ability to absorb complex information and he was able to process and reach an understanding in a way that many cannot. Peng was born in 1925 in the Guangdong province of China and from a young age became fascinated with all things biology. Peng loved life and wanted to understand its deeper complexities and he gained an infatuation of researching flora and fauna alike. Peng joined the Central University of China, known today as the Nanyang University, and he graduated in 1947 and was almost immediately offered a position in the Shanghai Institute of Biochemistry, presumably because he had already displayed a lot of passion and knowledge about the topic. The Chinese Academy of Sciences also took a liking to Peng and saw his skills as being indispensable and they would have him join and lead several expeditions to Xinjiang, which is located in northwestern China. Peng's life didn't only consist of success though, and he did face some hardship. In 1957, he was diagnosed with a malign tumour, which he suffered with for quite some time. But thankfully, in the end, his treatment was successful and he made a full recovery in Shanghai. Over the years, it became clear that Peng didn't just have an intelligent mind, but he also came to be a competent outdoorsman as a result of all the time he was spending on these expeditions, hiking, camping, and having to use general survivalist skills. In 1980, the Chinese Academy of Sciences reached out once more to Peng to lead an expedition, and at the time, no one knew that this would be Peng's final trip. The 55-year-old biochemist was quoted as saying, I have a strong wish to explore the frontiers. I have the courage to pave a way in the wilderness. 
This expedition would see Peng leading a team in the expanse of the Lopno Desert, located in the Xinjiang region. As you might imagine, this was a largely uninhabitable area, with a mostly infertile landscape consisting of sand dunes and a salt encrusted basin where the Tarim Lake once resided. At this time, Peng was the Vice President of the Xinjiang branch of the Academy, and this trip would see him lead a team of chemists, geologists, biologists, and archaeologists in the summer of 1980. Peng's role in this trip was to measure the amount of potassium in this mineral rich area. I'm not entirely sure why this was the case though, or what the goals were. Before his disappearance, he also managed to discover over a dozen new wild species, though it's not clear what they were. Just for some context, Lop Nu is around 2,500 feet above sea level and covers an area of around 1,160 square miles. The road that the team were travelling was easy going at first, but days into their travels, it quickly transitioned into sand dunes and jagged gravel. The group began to run low on supplies, though the only major concern was water, but Peng was determined to continue on. Five days after Peng made the decision to continue on, on the 17th of June, 1980, Peng left a note in his tent telling his teammates that he went to retrieve some water, only he would never return. When word reached Beijing, top officials in the central government were said to have been very frustrated. I can actually imagine that to be true too. Beijing's government structure is very top-down heavy, and a culture of punishing the messenger exists there. So people hate being the ones to deliver bad news, as was the case here with Peng. There are a whole range of factors for this behaviour, but one major one is that the ruling party over there hates to be embarrassed, both on the world stage and internally and they hate others knowing of their own misfortune or failures, which they considered this to be. Upon learning of Peng's disappearance, they launched a large-scale search operation with heavy military involvement and oversight, along with making the investigation highly visible to the public to let their people know that they were throwing their resources at finding Peng. The military put boots on the ground at the location of the group's campsite, and they set up supply lines so that the search could be concentrated for some time. When searches on the ground came up fruitless, over 10 military planes and helicopters were dispatched to fly over the area, but Peng could not be located. Six police officers were brought in, who were part of a specialised search dog unit, but they too couldn't find Peng. It's not clear for how long the search continued, but at some point it was called off, and a second investigation began in November of 1980. But as far as I can tell, that search was also fruitless. I did some further digging on this case, and I actually came across something that I find to be highly unusual that was reported by the Arlington Heights Daily Herald of suburban Chicago. On the 16th of October, 1981, they reported this. Chinese radio and television carried lengthy reports Thursday saying Peng passed away while searching for water. To save transportation costs for the state, Peng started out to find water by himself in 120 to 150 degree heat on June 17. After making four large-scale searches through the area, authorities in Xinjiang province found Peng's footprints, his sugar ration coupons, and signs he sat down at a point six miles northeast of where he was last seen. It is concluded that Peng lost his way, then sat puzzling on the ground, and was eventually buried by strong winds blowing sand. That, to me, sounds very strange. Peng travelled six miles. When his search for water was clearly failing, did he not think to turn back? It also sounds to me like they found his final position when his footprints seemed to lead to a place where he sat down and the footprints went no further. Surely a dig at or near to that spot would have uncovered his body if he was there. The reporting also seems very inconsistent to me. The Chinese press reports were saying that they believed that the sand had buried him, but they could still see his footprints, sugar ration coupons, and the place he sat down. Something is absolutely not adding up there. How could he have been buried, but not the rations, the footprints, and the signs of sitting? What happened to Peng here? It's worth mentioning that the Chinese public found this disappearance to be very strange, and they wouldn't let it go. It seems to me that because it was highly publicised and everyone knew about it, rumours began to spring up surrounding Peng. On the 12th of October, 1980, the Yuma Sun reported this. The expedition's base camp was in the area of Lop Nur, 
a nearly dry salt lake and reportedly a site of secretive Chinese tests. Letters quoted in the Hong Kong newspaper speculated that the United States intelligence may have been involved in Peng's disappearance. It's worth mentioning that the ruling party over in China often blame America for things, so I suppose that this accusation isn't too surprising. Or is there something more to the accusations? On the same day, the Joplin Globe reported this. The Hong Kong newspaper quoted the scientist's acquaintances as saying Peng Jiamu was seen September 14 at a restaurant in Washington. It's reported that a man denied being Peng and left quickly. The newspaper said that Peng was seen by friends including Deng Ti Fang, son of Deng Xiaoping, one of several Chinese vice premiers. The newspaper quoted letters from two visiting Chinese scholars, including one who had known Peng for 30 years, saying that he recognised him at the restaurant and later told Chinese authorities of the meeting. That went to places that I wasn't quite expecting and were left with some things to unpack. Before that though, it's important to clarify that the Chinese authorities official position was that Peng had been buried in the sand there. First of all, I can find no hard evidence that Peng was in Washington on the 14th of September, nor can I find any evidence or mention of him being involved with the US. Though, that's not to say that he wasn't, just that I can't find any evidence to indicate that he was. It seems to me that one of two things could have happened here and I make no allegations. Either he was in some capacity defecting or planning to defect to the US and the Chinese authorities caught wind of this and took him from the campsite. Or Peng did go out for some water and something happened to him whilst doing so. The fact that Peng was highly spoken of and held a high position in the academy and was literally leading an expedition doesn't scream to me that he was a defector. I think that his actions contradict that statement somewhat at the very least, but of course we can never know that for sure. What could have happened here is that because the people of China wanted answers in regards to his disappearance, it is not impossible that the story of defection was concocted to change the people's perceptions of Peng, and to make them dislike him because the authorities weren't completely sure as to what had happened and couldn't come up with anything that would appease the public. Of course, I want to make it completely clear that those two scenarios are speculation and we have absolutely no idea what happened to Peng or where he ended up, but his disappearance was certainly unusual to say the least. A big problem when it comes to the ruling party in China is that it is incredibly difficult to ascertain what is actually happening because they are incredibly secretive and hard to trust. I want to make it clear though that I am specifically talking about the ruling party and not China in general, nor the Chinese people. In any case, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this one, what happened to Peng Jiamu? Now at this point, we're going to finish with a disappearance that took place on the Indian border with China. Specifically, this incident occurred on Mount Nun, located in the Kashmir Himalayas. To be quite honest with you, I wasn't sure if I should even talk about this one, because the more I read about it, the more confusing the reports become, and ultimately, I have absolutely no idea what happened, but let's have a look. Thomas A. Murch was an American geologist and planetary scientist. He was a professor at Brown University in Rhode Island, and he was in that position from 1960 up until his disappearance in 1980. Thomas had actually led a very interesting and adventurous life, from being an active member of mountaineering clubs, followed by a stint in the South Korean military as an artillery officer. After this, he came back to the States where he acquired his PhD in geology. More specifically though, Thomas disappeared on the 6th of October 1980 while descending from Mount Nun. According to AmericanAlpineClub.org, Thomas passed away on October 6, 1980, at the age of 49 while descending from the summit of Mount Nun in northern India, following a bivouac above 21,000 feet with two former students on an expedition which he initiated and led. He was last seen on the morning of the 6th on a precarious ledge at the bivouac site above the steep northwest face of the mountain. After a fall the previous day, and the loss of a crampon needed to continue the descent. When one of his two companions, Tom Binnett returned that evening with a spare crampon, Thomas was gone and only his ice axe remained. So from what I can gather here, the team, 
Or at least Thomas, while descending, had a fall the prior day on the 5th, which left him stuck on a precarious ledge. Though, because of the fall, he lost one of his crampons, which meant that he couldn't make it down the rest of the way to his teammates. Presumably, Thomas's two companions tried to help the situation, but eventually, Tim had to go retrieve another crampon because Thomas had no way of getting down with only one. When Tim returned on the evening of the 6th, Thomas was missing and only his axe remained on the ledge. I'm sure that there are lots of complexities here that we can't fully appreciate from that description. What was the second companion doing during this time? Clearly, he didn't stay with Thomas, so did he accompany Tim? That's not clear in the slightest. But again, we probably have to assume that there are complexities here that we can't fully understand. Reports seem to conflict and get weird at this stage, so let's have a look at some official press reports. Five days after Thomas disappeared, the Dover Times reporter stated this. According to reports received here today from the Climbers Base Camp, 370 miles to the north, Thomas Much, leader of a seven-member American expedition scaling the 23,000-foot Mount Nun in the Himalayas, passed away while making an assault on the summit. Much's body was brought to the town of Cargill from the base camp at Tangui. Following his passing on Tuesday, the United News of India reported. The domestic news agency gave no details of his passing and his hometown in the United States was not immediately known. So, we immediately have our first discrepancy. The American Alpine Club make no mention of Thomas ever being found, only that he had disappeared and that his ice axe was the only thing to remain. American press reports at the time of disappearance were mostly stating that his body was recovered and sent to Cargill. It's worthy of mention that newspapers in the US were reporting the same text basically word for word on the 11th and 12th. On October the 13th, Panama City News Herald brought some more information about Thomas to light. I quote, Thomas Murch, an associated administrator of the US space program NASA, has passed away while leading a seven-member American expedition scaling the 23,000-foot Mount Nun in the Himalayas. The cause of his passing has not been disclosed. The article then repeats that Thomas's body was taken to Cargill and all press reports are basically the same word for word on the 13th and 14th. On the 15th, press reports are still the same, only adding that details surrounding his passing are not known at this time. After some further digging, I found something absolutely weird, so let's get bizarre. I think it's probably best if I just read this press report out to you. On the 28th of October, 1983, the Galveston Daily News reported this. New Delhi, India. Two Polish climbers found the frozen body of an American climber who disappeared three years ago near the summit of a Himalayan peak. The Indian Mountaineering Foundation said Thursday. Thomas Murch, 49, suffered a head injury while climbing the 23,000 foot Nun Peak in India's Lakh region. He vanished after his two companions went down to seek help. The foundation reported that the Polish climbers Boylan Agras and Pilip Jersey found Much's body about 660 feet from the summit. His rucksack was still strapped to his shoulders, the climbers said. The two were unable to bring Much's body down from the mountain, but took several photographs to identify the victim and the location. Much, a Brown University geology professor who was on leave to work for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was descending the mountain on October the 5th, when he fell into a crevice. Two companions pulled him free, but he was unconscious and they left him in a makeshift shelter to go for help. When they returned, Much was gone and they theorised that he had regained consciousness, tried to climb down and fell a second time. Uh, what? What was happening with the press reports the three years prior who was stating that Thomas's body had been taken to Cargill? Was that simply not true? And if so, why in the world was that being lied about? Or had they found a body that they believed to belong to Thomas, but wasn't actually him? This quite literally cannot be any other kind of mistake because the difference between having a body and transporting it and not having a body at all is perhaps among the most easily distinguishable things that can ever happen. 
Reports never indicate what kind of search was organised for Thomas, but I think that we have to assume that there was some sort of effort, given that the authorities knew about it and it was being reported on by the press. This news report also makes it clear that the second companion also joined Tim in retrieving help. Given that Tim returned the same evening with a spare crampon, that could mean that the second companion made his way to civilization to notify the authorities and to get help. When Tim came back, Thomas was no longer there, and the only thing remaining was his ice axe, so where did he go? Again, I think we have to assume that there was some sort of search effort, which presumably would have been localised beneath the ledge that he was on. The question is, was he actually found then and there, and transported to Cargill, or was he missing for the next three years until his frozen remains were found by the Polish climbers? And if that is the case, then how did that even happen? And why was false information being reported? I actually find myself siding with the Galveston Daily News report because they cite the Indian Mountaineering Foundation who reported the discovery of the find. And I just don't see what motivation they could have had to report and lie about finding a missing person. The paper trail goes cold here as far as I can tell. What in the world happened to Thomas Much? Did he simply fall that day for a second time off the ledge? And if so, why couldn't he be located after that? Or was he located and transported to Cargill? Or was he literally missing for three years after that? Good actual lord, you're gonna have to leave your thoughts about this one. What even happened here? I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching. And a big thank you to the patrons who've been running around and disappearing on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell, and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike. I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day, or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys. Peace.